Hello all and welcome to Devnet Create. In this segment, we would like to bring forward stories of people from all around the globe who have used tech for good. I'm Shweta, developer advocate at Cisco Devnet, and today joining me is Mark Colella. Hi Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, Mark is working on an interesting project which is about autonomous living program, which is a health and support care system for the elderly. So Mark, why don't you walk us through what ex exactly this project is all about? Absolutely, thank you, love to be here. It's a cause that's near and dear to my heart specifically. So the actual project came from a, uh, a transformation of services coming from one of our key ministries that supports adults with uh, disabilities. And the whole goal and rally purposes was to provide more, individual, and more individualized funding and support for those individuals. And as we all know, COVID has actually enhanced some of the issues as we, 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 we handle those individuals today. Congregate group settings, um, group homes are no longer con conducive. And so what we, what we began on a journey with was how do we use technology as a safeguard to better augment support, to provide more individualized support and outcomes for those that are being supported. Um, and so for us, and a great example of that, um, people is for predominantly 80% of the funding um, to support these individuals. So a great example would be if there's four individuals that are being supported by an agency, two want to go bowling, two want to stay at home. Um, the existing um, methodology to handle that is that either all four needs to go bowling or all four needs to stay home. And so we're trying to use technology to provide much more individualized support to drive the outcome and more inclusive outcome for these individuals. So with, with technology is how do we enable them to maybe provide or scale that support, let's say from a one to two or one to four setting to maybe um, allowing those two to go bowling, but we have technology through sensory data, whether that's through um, sensors on the stove, door, the ability to, um, to detect, to sense, um, and also the ability to interact and using technology to enable that. And so that's kind of really a very simple use case, but very, very important because all future funding within the province of Ontario is moving through individualized. And so we're also we're trying to help to deliver better services for the agencies delivering it, but more importantly, getting the families to also help to support those, those, those individuals that are requiring support. Wow, this is an amazing initiative. And you mentioned there are sensors who, uh, which help in um, getting the alerts in and then uh, you know, it's part of the whole workflow. So what kind of sensors or collaboration devices and tools are you using in this entire workflow? Yeah, so great question. And so it's, it's, there's really two components to kind of how we're using technology to, to address this problem. One is we needed a very interactive application and thankfully being at Cisco, we have the power of WebEx. Um, so how do we use WebEx um, and things like WebEx um, AI and the WebEx assistant to be the baseline to communicate both from a family member or individual to caregiver. Um, how do we have both um, internal kind of communication, both let's say from a messaging team um, to a um, outbound for, you know, 911, et cetera. So that's one component. Um, the second component is using the power of a Meraki platform to create a connected health situation. So we are using sensory data for things like water on and off. Have they, has the participant had the ability to wake up to take a shower? We can provide proactive notifications because now we have visibility into if the water is running. Similarly to that, we also know that if they've left the water on, how do we potentially avoid a flood? Other things like um, sensory on stoves, uh, we then start knowing whether you know the stove was open or closed. Um, other types of things is we can use sensory data to see kind of when they're sleeping at night or, or they're, they're taking a nap, heartbeats as an example. And then, you know, if the heartbeat threshold exceeds that is normal for that individual, we can trigger a notification alert to the, um, the, the personal support worker or family members saying that maybe Jimmy got up. Do we want to prompt the notification or maybe do we want to just maybe check in to make sure Jimmy's okay? Those are just some very basic use cases, but that's what we're looking to accomplish using technology as a safeguard to augment support but also giving these individuals an opportunity to live like you and I. We take a lot of things for granted. As an example, our morning routine. We know that we have to get up, brush our teeth, wash our face. Um, you know, we know that we need to clean behind our ears and in the time to do it. Well, these individuals need support. And so 
using WebEx um, that is very customized to a, a central app that can work on any on any device, we can prompt these notifications in routines to the point where we can even put previous videos to help accelerate um, those routines to ensure um, that technology can maybe help drive some of those routines and behavior for more in, 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 in inclusive outcomes. So that's just a kind of great example that I think that we're using technology to, um, to drive the outcome, but more importantly, providing some individualized support at the same time. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I'm sure there are a lot of building blocks. It's, it's not a straightforward solution. Um, obviously, you've been dealing with a lot of components. So what were the difficulties or the challenges which you faced since inception and as project is ongoing here? Yeah, that's, uh, again, another fantastic question. We all know with technology, when we start dealing with the art of the possible, anything's possible. Our technologies are very robust. Um, our technologies are capable. In this situation, it's how do we address multiple individuals' needs? As an example, how do we make sure that we can address nonverbal individuals using the platform? How do we work to address non-visual individuals? Um, it's, more of, it, it's more of how do we customize the technology to address a specific need, while at the same time making it fairly consistent and open. Um, so I think that has been kind of one of our key challenges, but thankfully uh, through the Innovation, Innovation Labs team, we've conducted some pretty good design sprints where we've taken the technology out of the, of the equation. We're really focused on what is the problem we're looking to um, achieve. And we've actually had all the different stakeholders, whether it's participants and individuals using this particular platform, the family members, the personal support workers, um, the agencies themselves, as well as government that are looking to fund this as well. And so with that, it's made our job a little um, a little easier. And then building this technology, we're using um, a very dynamic, I think it's the term is waterfall, I'm a salesperson, but so forgive me if I'm wrong, but where we can actually have inputs and adjust the workflows based on the feedback. So that's been very helpful as well. But at the same time, um, a lot of individuals requiring this technology of support has very broad and different types of um, requirements. And so thankfully, we have great technology and we have great people running it, but that kind of I would say would be the number one challenge in allowing us to be successful. But I think we've been overcoming this in our um, uh, every three week design sprints. Um, we're continually mapping out. We're con continually having the right individuals participate, test it, and we're quickly adapting. So how can people who have such technological background and they really want to volunteer or support such kind of causes, how can they get started with? That is, um, I, I, we would love all the support. So first off, my name is Mark Kalala. Happy to reach out to myself. Um, if not, I definitely would recommend finding an agency. Um, we have three agencies that are leading this, uh, Meta, Class, and Rena, which is the lead sponsor. We have some day program and creating alternatives as well um, that are helping us. So getting involved in any one of those four agencies I, I, I'd reference. Um, or, or anything um, like that to that matter, but we're always welcoming to expanding our team. So don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, um, more importantly, I do think that this technology, as much as we're trying to address specifically adults with disability, the same use cases and platform can help elderly, people with dementia, other types of connected healthcare uh, use cases and other types of um, um, similar type of outcomes. So. Um, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to connect and uh, we're always happy to expand the team. Mark, thank you so much for sharing it with us today. Thank you for having me. So we have more stories like this for you in this segment. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Welcome to DevNet Create. I'm joined with Annie and Jennifer, who are going to share with us their project AI for Good. Hello, Annie and Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining us today. Can you share us a bit about what AI for Good is and what your team has done uh, so far? Absolutely. Thank you for having us, Shweta. So AI for Good is a program that I started a number of years ago that would enable people who have 
um, technical skills and non-technical skills to be able to give back pro bono. So for example, I don't know about you, but I am terrible at building houses. So I feel like every time I volunteer with somewhere like Habitat for Humanity, they're, it's like they're volunteering to me, not the other way around. But with AI for Good, uh, people can use their engineering skills or project management skills, especially their data science, AI, and ML skills to be able to make a difference for nonprofits who really can't afford to buy those type of skills or don't have the expertise to understand how they could use these types of innovative technologies to be able to further their mission. And Annie and I started working on AI for suicide prevention uh, almost two years ago at this point. Uh, she had been incredibly active in AI for Good in Vancouver. I had started Cisco's program, and we really put our two heads together, um, which was now really just one one big brain, um, and thought about what where can we really make a difference, right? We felt that if we got a really passionate team together and we just picked one thing to work on, that we could move the ball forward um, pretty significantly. And almost two years later, we have, uh, we chose to work on suicide prevention because number one, um, it's, it's an area that really doesn't have a lot of, uh, a lot of AI and ML and data science resources applied to it. Um, it's obviously very, very qualitative, not as quantitative as it could be, even though there's a lot of research out there. And secondly, it's a cause that's very important to me personally. Um, so we really took the time to firstly um, you know, scour the, the range of suicide prevention to read a lot of research and to understand where there were, there were quantitative opportunities that could be um, you know, good vectors of approach for us. And we chose one and here we are today. Wow, that's fantastic. So what role does AI and ML play in this project of suicide prevention? Yeah, before I talk about AI and ML, um, I want to provide some additional context. So the type of research that, that you know, Jen and, and the group um, have looked through together with the mental health experts is that it turns out that how a suicide is reported can play a really uh, big factor um, leading to another suicide. So there's been research that's shown that after highly publicized suicide um, in the media, there's a 13% increase in the national suicide rate um, in, in the U.S. So it really shows that the way journalists uh, report on suicide can you know, produce harm. So our work um, in suicide prevention, you know, honing on that, um, to help journalists reduce the harm in articles suicide can have by using data science, machine learning, to build a detector for harmful language in uh, media reports. It's kind of like how Grammarly checks the grammar mistakes in your text. That's the technology we built. Uh, answering your question, how AI and ML play here, um, basically the AI and ML is the backbone of this, this checker. Um, I also wanted to highlight how important it is um, that the machine learning needs um, the training data uh, to, to power uh, this model. And, and this data was provided by um, over 100 uh, Cisco volunteers that Jen helped uh, gather together. Uh, and with their help, marking up harmful sentences in thousands of articles, we were able to train this machine learning model. That is fantastic. So any thoughts on how people who have a data science background or interest in AI and ML, how can they volunteer to such causes or where can they get started with? Yeah, I can I can talk about for me. Um, so I have been organizing a data science for social good meetup group here locally in Vancouver. Um, so that's, that's, you know, looking out for meetup groups. Um, I know it, it may be a little bit just harder during the pandemic, but I think there's still a little bit of stuff there. Um, here in Canada, there's also something called Data Farms, Data for Good. They run what they call Data Farms, kind of like hackathons, where they have like one special data set um, for events. And then for the weekend, Data scientists would get together, analyze the data set, and you know have some findings for um, for charitable organizations. Um, for me, you know, partnering with Jen, she has 
you know, um, a lot of passion into the suicide prevention. That to me is um, really the best thing I can get out from from volunteering. That I have the data science skill set. I partner with someone with the knowledge and the passion and the cause. I, I really think that it's really like putting two heads uh, into one. Thank you, Annie. And I, to add on to that, within um, Cisco, I'm very happy to say that the overarching AI for Good program is in place. It's run by a woman named Aria Taylor. But, uh, anyone listening to this can't find her. You can always reach out to me. And Suicide Prevention is a program that we've been you know, proud to lead for the past couple of years, as Annie said, with a number of incredibly talented team members and volunteers. But there are also a number of other programs. Our goal in creating the program was to allow people to volunteer in the way that matters to them most. So whatever your passion is, um, you can you can either, you know, be someone who's, you know, maybe rallying the troops or, you know, working with the nonprofits or you can volunteer on the data science side. Um, but it really does take, um, you know, everyone says data science is a team sport. And it's very true, as Annie said, you need people of all types uh, to be able to create an effective team to make a real difference in the world. And we've been proud to see just how many other uh, causes have been championed by this program. And then before we uh, leave, I, I do want to share one thing that the viewers can do to help prevent suicide. Um, one of the big things you can do is not use the term commit suicide. The mental health research that we reviewed shared that because people use the term commit, which is associated only with sins and crimes, not with illnesses, it helps to stigmatize, unfortunately, mental illness. So if you say that somebody died by suicide, somebody had suicidal ideation, but never committed suicide. Um, another thing is to never talk about someone's method of suicide, um, because what we've seen in the research is the copycat suicides are typically in the same method as the original. And to always be an advocate for, for mental health, don't be afraid to ask people how their mental health is doing. You know, Don't be afraid to share how your mental health is. It's it's incredibly stigmatized, but it's just as important as physical health. And I think if we can all get to the point where we can talk about it, just like we do physical health, we can save a lot of lives and not even that, but just improve the quality of our own lives. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Annie, for sharing this information with us and also to giving an insight into how AI and data science can actually benefit these areas as well. Thank you, Shweta. Thank you so much. Thank you.